Good morning. In my preparation for this week, uh, what I laid out for this week hasn't been exactly where I've gone. I'm grateful that God, God speaks and uh, gives us direction. God's a good communicator. How many believe that? God's a good communicator. You seem very confident. Yet many times when we want to know God's plans for us, we think God's a bad communicator. Have you ever felt like God has played in uh, hide and seek with you when it comes to uh, answering your questions about God? What, what do you want me to do? Do you struggle to believe that God wants you to know what he created you to do? Let's just get some involvement here. How many of you would agree with me that you are unique, nobody else like you? Elbows above ears. Okay, good, hands down. How many of you agree that you were created by God? All right, elbows down. Let's go with your other hand this time if you can agree with this one. Uh, how many of you agree that God has plans for you? Okay. And you've already said this. You agree with me that God's a good communicator. How many of you have struggled in discerning, God, what are you calling me to do? How many of you struggle with that? Okay, so there's a problem. God's a good communicator. I'm unique. He has plans for me. I struggle with hearing from him. So where's the problem? Us. Who? Us. Us. Speak for yourself. Don't put the rest of it. <laughs> How many of you agree? It's us. So what is that struggle? If God's a good communicator, so are we just bad listeners? What if God's waiting for the right time to speak? What if God's waiting for the right time? Okay. So maybe it's timing issues. So maybe it, it could be our listening problems. Maybe uh, it's our patient problems, right? Okay, I'm confident we'll answer both of those questions and those issues today. I'm doing two sessions. Now, you could be confused if you look at your notes. There's session four and session five. Session four comes before five, okay? It's not too profound, so make sure you're on session four, a jealous God, okay? So we're going to do this one, and about five after 12, we're going to flip the page and do the next session, all right? So you're getting double your money's worth this morning. So we're going we're gonna to move along quickly. So you should be at session four, I am confident, let me say this just to get your wheels turning, and then we're going to hop in here and look at who God is. I am confident that when we struggle to hear from God, the struggle isn't God communicating to us. I think that most times the struggle isn't even timing or our ability or lack of ability to listen. I'm confident the struggle struggle most times is our lack of surrender. See, when, when we're talking to God and we say, okay, God, I have some options. What do you want me to do with my life? You know, God, I want to serve you, God. Uh, what do you want me to do? Okay, that's a question. And then we wait on God. And I think God usually answers it like this. Well, are you willing? And then we respond with this. Well, what do you want me to do? And then God says, are you willing? And now it's our turn. And then we say, well, what is it? What are, what are you calling me to do? And then we say, well, what is it? And you notice how the game progresses. What do you want me to do? God says, well, are you willing? <laughs> I'm not going to say, God, I'm going to do it when I don't know what you're calling me to do. And that's why we find it hard to hear from God when it comes to his plans for us. 
Because we're not going to say yes until we know what we're saying yes to. Ooh. Yesterday we talked about a true step of faith. We've got to take that true step of faith. I think that's our holdup. I believe our number one struggle is our struggle to surrender. And when we surrender and say, okay, yes, God, whatever it is, I'll do it, then God's free to show us in his time. Now, the question came to me afterwards yesterday, so, but, but how do I know this is what God wants me to do? So we're going to uh, answer that one specifically in the second session today. Uh, in this first session, we're just going to look at something about God, okay? If I were to introduce you to the rest of the group, why don't you come up here, sir? Why should I tell you how this could be? Let's just do it, okay? What's your name? Dwayne. Dwayne, okay? This is my friend Dwayne. I want you to meet him. Uh, and would you welcome him to the uh, Charity Youth Bible School? Would you do that for him, please? Okay. Yeah, wow, okay. So I don't know a lot about Dwayne, but I know he's a very jealous man, okay? So uh, that's Dwayne, my uh, jealous friend Dwayne. I'm glad to have you here, and I hope you all enjoy my friend Dwayne. Thank you. You can sit down, okay? Are you good with that kind of an introduction? You're good with that, okay? <laughs> have you ever been introduced like that before? No. <laughs> uh, do you like to be introduced as a jealous man? Not really, okay? Some of you kind of chuckled when I said this, is, you know, my friend Dwayne's a jealous man. Uh, how many of you expected me to introduce him like that? Uh-huh, yeah, because you looked at the paper, right? <laughs> Have you ever been introduced as a jealous person? All right, let's just do this. In your mind, when you hear somebody is jealous, how many say, oh, that's not a good thing? Your initial feeling is, that's bad. I don't want to be called jealous, okay? You know why? Because there is so little that you and I can be rightfully jealous over. Did you know that at least 27 times in Scripture, God is introduced as jealous? And that's a good introduction for God. In fact, one time in Exodus, it says, God, whose name is jealous, how many of you have prayed and the way you talked to God was, oh, jealous father? <laughs> okay, you guys you just laugh at that, right? That's scripture. That's his name. He's jealous. Now, we know God's completely good. So why, why would jealousy not be a good thing for Dwayne and for the rest of us, and yet it would be a good thing for God? You know why? Because there is so few things that Dwayne can rightfully be jealous over. What can God be jealous over? Us? That's the first thing for sure. A relationship, A relationship with us? The glory of his name? Okay, what has God not created? It's all his, right? So he can be jealous over it. It's really his. You know, for you to take, what gives you a right to be jealous over something is if it's yours, Okay? Uh, so if somebody just, you know, come, maybe this would work for the guys. So somebody just said, hey, I want to borrow your car. I'm like, sure, no problem, you can borrow my car. Uh, and they bring it back the next day and said, hey, you know, I, I hope you're cool with this. I painted it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't paint my car. Why, why would that be offensive? It's not yours. You borrowed it. If you want to paint your car, paint your car. You can do that, okay? And see, God, everything, God has created everything. Revelation 4, 11, all things were created for his pleasure. Everything was created for God. So it's his. He can be jealous over it. For myself, I think there's three things I can be jealous over. One is, and all of you will connect on this one, your relationship, my relationship with God. I need to guard that with jealousy, okay? The second thing is my relationship with my wife. And for any of you that are married today, you need to guard the relationship with your spouse with jealousy because my wife, 
She's my wife and nobody else's. And if I don't care that some other man starts giving her attention that, that shouldn't be, that's wrong, okay? Because she is my wife. God's given a word to, to be one flesh as long as we both shall live. I need to guard that with jealousy. I can be good. So my relationship with God, my relationship with my wife, and then my children. Now, when I say jealousy over my children, that doesn't mean that nobody else can talk to them, nobody else speaking their life. No, I want people speaking their lives, but I am their dad. And so I need to be the one that pursues my children. I need to be the one that cares about them. And when I see them struggling, my heart should care because that's my child. And so I can look on my child with jealousy in that way. And that's a good thing. Beyond that, I don't think there's anything I can be jealous over, even my car. Don't paint it, please. But... Uh, you know, really, who, who gave me the right to the nicest cars? You know, so if somebody else comes with a nicer clothes or a bigger house or a better whatever, we get jealous over those things? That's a negative thing because who gave us the right to whatever, right? We don't have those rights. Let's just write this down. God is a jealous God. I'm sorry, we'll get the power, PowerPoint up to speed here. God's a jealous God, and that's a good thing. God is a jealous God. And we can also write this down. We've been created to bring glory to God. God's a jealous God. And when you hear this, that God's a jealous God, that should do something good to your heart. Because that means he's jealous over you. Ooh. Yesterday morning, I took my oldest son out for breakfast just because he's my son. I care about my son. I want to connect with him. Uh, and we had a good breakfast together. That's a good thing for a father to do with his son. Okay? How much more does my heavenly father look on me, look on you with jealousy? And it's not the kind of jealousy that says, I'm an authoritative, I'm going to keep you in No. It's a loving heavenly father. And he's created you to bring him glory. How amazing is that, that we can bring the creator of the universe, we can bring him glory, okay? Now, I believe, with this in mind, I believe there are really only two kinds of people in this earth, and it's not men and women like this. I believe there are two kinds of people. Number one, those are vessels. Let's write this down, vessels. A vessel is uh, someone that's there. You're there not for your own purpose, but for someone else's. Uh, this will work for us. We have this plant up here, right? We have this vase that this plant is in, okay? I'm confident that the reason this is here is not because they wanted a, a square white box on the stage, right? This is here for one purpose. It's to make this look good, okay? Now, now, if you don't think this thing makes it look good, let's pull this thing out of here and just set it here by itself. It'll probably fall over, uh, and it wouldn't look very nice. But we get this vase here. Uh, maybe it's not a vase, pardon me, but anyways. Uh, we get this thing around it, and now it holds it up there. And so when we come into the church and we say, wow, those are nice plants up there, you don't really look at it and say, wow, amazing vase. No. That's what a vessel is, okay? That is there to make that plant look good. Two kinds of people. One is vessels. We understand we're not on this earth to make ourselves look good or to bring attention to ourselves. We're here for God's glory. The second type of people are thieves. These are those who live for themselves. They want glory for themselves. Those who live to get praise for themselves. And, and you need to be careful about this because there can be thieves in the church. Wow, like you taught Sunday school, you led the singing, and then you were in charge of the kids club this week. Like you are doing like everything our church could not do without you. I'm getting noticed. Could I preach next Sunday too? And after a while, we can start to do all these good things to get attention. And that's not being a vessel. The solution isn't stop doing good things. The solution is we do what we do for God's glory. Are you a vessel or are you a thief? You see, when we talk about hearing from God and needing to surrender, why would we struggle with surrender? Maybe it's because we want to be in charge of our life. 
We're trying to keep something that's not our own. Church means of or belonging to the Lord. If that's true of who we are, then why do we str struggle with saying, yes, Lord? Maybe we're more like a thief than a vessel. I want to look at a story in Scripture today to help us understand this. Before we do that, let's just write this down. Our job, our job is to be submitted and faithful for God's glory. If you're here saying, okay, I want to take a step of faith. In fact, I have. I've said, yes, Lord. But then how do I know? This is your job. And, and this is what a step of faith is. It's saying, yes, Lord, before you know what you're saying yes to. And you're going to find some things intertwined between yesterday's session and today. It, submission is saying, yes, Lord. If you say, well, how do, I, how do I find God's will for me? Submit. So you're saying, yes, Lord. And then what? Be faithful. Be faithful. Let me tell you a story, and then we'll explain that a little further. Submit and be faithful. In Daniel chapter 3, a Bible story that makes it in every Sunday school, every Bible school curriculum, somewhere along the line. We have the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think if they were living today, they'd probably be here. I'm guessing they're your age, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let's just jump into their shoes here a little bit. You're growing up as a Hebrew young man. Uh, what do you think, what types of dreams, visions do they have for their life? That's hard to tell because you didn't grow up in their shoes. You didn't grow up as a Hebrew. Uh, probably they dreamed of being captured and taken away from their parents to a strange land. No, huh? Probably they dreamed of just eating veggies and drinking water. Now, all the men know that's not true. <laughs> you know, I don't think they ate just their veggies and water back home in Israel. They dreamed of not having a family, being separated from their own family, being in a dark place spiritually. I'm confident that everything about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's life that we see in Daniel chapter 3 was not in their plans. Would you agree with me? But we know them. They're popular guys in history. How did they get there? How did they get there? In Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar has made, and we're going to go through this quickly because you know the story, he's made an image over 90 feet tall. It's for his glory. Now, he is a thief. He's going to bring attention to himself. And this image is all about King Nebuchadnezzar. And so on this day, he invites all those who have any position in his government. He brings all of them. You're to come, and we're going to play the music. And when the orchestra plays, everybody bows down to my image. And this is a great celebration. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are amongst those that are there. The music starts, and everybody bows down. And when I read Daniel chapter 3, I realize that people really haven't changed much from then till now. Two reasons. You know why? Number one, somebody peaked in prayer. <laughs> Everybody bows down. Nobody knows if somebody's standing unless they peaked. And they did. And the second thing I find out about people is they tattle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like today. Oh, he did that. Yeah, he did. Somebody comes to me, kingdom. You know what? The music is still probably playing. There's three Hebrews, and they didn't bow down. So King Nebuchadnezzar stops, calls these men to come up there, and I don't know what it looked like. I don't, you know, was there a big image here and his thrones here and the people? I don't know what it looked like, but it is all in this same area. King Nebuchadnezzar talks to these guys and says, hey, listen, and he understands they're Hebrews. So maybe there was a cross-cultural misunderstanding here. He shows some patience that is not character of Nebuchadnezzar, not typical of his character. He says, listen, guys, when the music plays, you're to bow down. And if you don't, you're going to throw in the fiery furnace. So listen, we're going to do it again. And can you imagine this? This isn't a dress rehearsal before a wedding, right? This is the real party. Okay, band, 
I want you to start over. We had three Hebrews who didn't get it the first time. So everybody back on your feet. We're going to do this all over. Now, you didn't think of the story like this, but I, this is pretty much how it went. We're going to do this again so that the Hebrews get it. And if you don't bow down this time, I'm throwing you in the fiery furnace. And what God can deliver you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say this. King, you don't have to do it again. Our God that we serve is able. And you know what? In our movements today, in these, in these wealth and health, prosperity, gospel, and you name it and you get it, this type of thing, they need to read Daniel chapter 3. Our God is able but not required. It is wrong for us to require God to do what we ask. We can cry out in the name of Jesus. And it's one thing when we know it's his will. They didn't know if it's, is it God's will for them to die today in the fire? Or is it God's will for them to live? They don't know. And you know who? It's up to who? It's up to God. Our, our, so it's back to the story. Our God is able to deliver us, but he might not, and that's okay. So they don't even play the music again. Woo! You know what I see from these guys right here? Submitted and faithful. Submitted and faithful. Let's write down something else here in our notes, okay? Submission answers the questions, what I do and where I do it. And when we're submitted to God, we're saying, okay, God, you can choose the what I do and you can choose the where I do it. Submission answers what I do, where I do it. Faithfulness answers the question. And by the way, these two are married. You've got to keep them together. Just submitting and then saying, okay, God, I'm willing, now show me. Like our brother said, sometimes the timing isn't right. And God always works on time. So what if it's not time for God to show you the next move? Then what? Here's your answer. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness answers the question, when? Which is now. It's today. You cannot project faithfulness into the future. If I were to ask you, are you faithful to God? What can you answer for? Well, I'm going to be. Okay, what are you telling me? You're not now. Faithfulness is about right now. Faithfulness answers the question, when and how? With all my heart. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I think at this point they were beginning to see God's plan, that he's going to use them to bring glory, to bring light to Babylon. But they didn't know how, and they didn't know how long it's going to be. So what do they do? They just submit. Okay, this is what you want us to do. This is where you want us to do it. Okay, we're fine with that, God. And then they were faithful. They were faithful. And faithfulness that day meant that they don't bow down to an idol. That would have been giving that image glory that only belonged to God. They understood God's a jealous God. We're not going to give that, that idol glory. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, if us bowing down means you're going to throw us in the fire, then you got to throw us in the fire because God's a jealous God. We're rightfully his. We're not going to give to that idol or you what belongs to God. Sorry. You know what they were doing? They were being submitted and faithful. And that's your calling today, to be submitted and faithful. That calling will never change. God's a good communicator. And if you're submitted, you're saying, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You're, you've taken that true step of faith. God, I'm willing. Then what do you do while you wait? You're faithful. You're faithful right where you're at. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. And you know what happens in the story? Amazing thing. So they're thrown in the fiery furnace, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, now he's ticked off. Like, they're not afraid of him. And yeah, you challenged, you said, what, God could, that's our God, but go ahead and throw us in the fiery furnace. He couldn't scare them into obeying him. So he has them cranked with the fire seven times hotter, and I don't know how you do that. Like, fire's hot's hot to me. But throws them into the fiery furnace, and to do this first, they tie him up. So they bind him up like this, gets his strongest men of the army to throw him in. Why the strongest men? The fire is seven times hotter than hot. So he needs strong men who don't get too close that they can throw them in, and they don't get burned themselves. But that didn't even work. Because the guys that threw them in, the fire is so hot, they fall down dead. Now, everybody watching, and as we understand the story, everybody who's there for this glory glory party for Nebuchadnezzar and his image, they're there watching. 
because he talks to them afterwards, so they're there. When these men throw the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, they fall down dead, and everybody in the audience is like, wow, hot fire. Like, this is no skit, all right? And this is no fake movement where people are falling over to make people think that something's going on. They fall down dead. The strongest man, everybody's like, ooh, hot fire. Then these guys in the fire stand up. That's significant. Because if you're bound and then you're thrown, you will not stand up. Disagree? Try it tonight. No, probably shouldn't. Uh, you, you can't get up. They stand up. The ropes have burned off. Everybody else says, hot fire. Yeah, look at that. They can stand up in there. And then King Nebuchadnezzar gets out of his seat. And he's like, I threw three men in. There's four. <laughs> he didn't say this, but I'm sure he saw this. <laughs> his men are dead on the ground. The three guys he threw in there are up walking around. There's a fourth man with them. They're no longer bound. And then he does this. He's like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out of there. He's going to call them out. I think I'm in great. Like, no, we're cool in here. You come in here. <laughs> they come out, and King Nebuchadnezzar smells them. And you picture this, this proud king. <laughs> they don't even smell like fire. You know, their hair isn't even singed. And then he turns to the audience, and get this picture, he turns to the audience, and he says, I hereby make a decree that if any of you say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to cut you up into pieces, make your house into a trash heap. You're dismissed. <laughs> That's how the party ended. Now, time out. I wonder why he didn't say, I'm going to throw you in the fire, because maybe they would have been saved. You know, we'll try this dicing thing and see how that would work. <laughs> Listen to this. They were dismissed on this note. If you say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to cut you in pieces and make your house into a dunghill. You're free to go. What do you think these men, women in that audience that day, what do you think they talked about that evening around the dinner table? King Nebuchadnezzar? The image? No. What did they talk about? The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let me tell you something even more amazing. The next morning when they got up to go to work, when their children got up to go to school, when their wives got up and were hanging out their laundry, and they looked up and they saw this big image that towers over the city, who do you think they thought about? Was it not the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You know what is so amazing in this story? That God took what King Nebuchadnezzar made for his glory and he turned it into a memorial to how great he is. Wow. And how did he do that? Through a few youth who were submitted and faithful. Angels aren't going to do that. God's going to use just ordinary young people who say, yes, Lord. And then while they wait for that next opportunity, they're faithful. Is this the end? Is this what God wants us to do the rest of our life? Is to you know, be smart and help figure things out in this kingdom for a wicked king? I don't know, but we're going to be faithful here. I think God has given you the ability to understand how to serve him today where you're at and next week when you're back home where you're at. I don't hear questions about, so how can I be faithful at home or in the church? I, th I think you know those things. Maybe you have a few things of, of what can we do more and, and those can be good questions, but I think we understand faithfulness, right? Right? So what we need to do is couple the faithfulness with the submission. And we say, yes, Lord, I'll go or I'll stay. Or I'll take this job, I'll leave this one, or I'll stay with this one. Up to you, God. And then while we wait to hear from God, what do we do? We're just faithful. We're just faithful. Because that's the kind of people that God uses, is faithful people. When is it right for you to sit back and wait? Say, okay, God, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. No, 
you're faithful in the waiting. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. That's what the call is for us to do. A true step of faith, let's write this down again, even though you had it yesterday. A true step of faith is saying, yes, Lord, before you know what you're saying yes to. Before you know what you're saying yes to. And just to help give us a picture of this, our job, your job today, if you're here and you're saying, well, how do I know what God's will is for me? Okay, stop wrestling with figuring out what God's plan is for you and just do this. Be submitted and faithful. Be submitted and faithful. That's your job. Okay? If God has plans for you and we've, we agree that he does, and if he's a good communicator and we agree that he does, he'll tell you. Your holdup most times will be your lack of submission. God's a jealous God over you. He has good plans for you. It would be foolish for God to create you unique and with plans and then to hide them from you. So if it seems that God's silent, be faithful. Keep being faithful. He'll tell you at the right time. Turn your paper over. Let's pray before we go on. Father, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just, they just, uh, their testimony just screams out at us. You got a whole lot of glory in a dark city from a proud king because of some youth who were submitted and faithful. Father, I pray that you would keep speaking to us. Speak truth to us about who we are, about your plans for us as we uh, look at a different person in Scripture. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn the page over to thinking of you. Jeremiah says this, or God said this in the book of Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew you. I'm going to give you five words that describe God's plan for you. And what I'm going to do is, uh, I'd like for you to turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, we have the story of God calling Moses. Now, I'm convinced that Moses had a pretty good idea of what God's plan was for him in life. He is a Hebrew raised in the palace so much that he looks like an Egyptian. His accent probably was even like an Egyptian, and I'm sure he spoke in their Egyptian language. Because when he is out at, in Midian in the desert after he has tried to redeem his people and he runs for his life, those that came to the well, when they went home and told their dad, it was like an Egyptian was there. You know, Moses is set up so well to deliver Israel from the Egyptians. He's a Hebrew, so it's his own people. But he's raised in the palace, so he's a child of the king. So he knows the customs, he knows the language, he knows how to go about, and he's got relationship with the powers. He's just set up to do this. And so one day when he sees an Egyptian and a Hebrew fighting and he goes to settle the fight and he gets a little too aggressive, as sometimes young men do in settling fights, uh, he kills the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the Egyptian. And he's protecting his people. And the next day when he goes out, he sees two Hebrews fighting. He's like, hey, 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 guys, settle. And he's going to settle this fight a different way because really it's his people. I think in Moses' heart, he had an idea already of what God was calling him to do. I wouldn't be surprised if in your heart, you already have an idea of what God's calling you to do in life. Unfortunately, is too often we think, okay, I know what God wants me to do, so that means it's time to do it. 
and then we want to skip the preparation. Let me say this to you. As young people here today, you are primarily in a time of preparation in life. Write that down, please. You are primarily in a stage of preparation. God cares much about preparing us for His work. Study the people in Scripture. Look at John the Baptist. You know, his birth was foretold. It was like, wow, and when the child was born, everybody's like, you know, whoa, what man or child will this be? They never said that about me when I was born or about you. It's like, okay, this guy, he's going to be something. And then guess what he does? He's sent off into the wilderness until he's 30 years old. Okay, now he's ready for ministry. David, he's anointed king, and I'm sure that rocked his world. Woo, I am not going to grow up to be like daddy and be a shepherd. I'm going to be the king of Israel. And then he was sent back to watch sheep. Then he was sent to play the harp for the king when he got grouchy. And then he was sent to lead the army in and out of battle and destroy the Philistines. And then he runs for his life. And anywhere from 15 to 20 years from the time David's anointed king till he comes to king. Joseph. Joseph has a vision from God. He has dreams. My family's going to serve me? That's cool for a little brother to get a vision like that, okay? If that came to a big brother, would be like, no, they do that already, right? Uh, but mom and dad and my older brothers, they're all going to bow down to me. I'm going to be in charge. Woo, wow, this is going to be amazing. Thirteen years later, it comes to pass. Are you willing to be submitted and faithful for 13 years before you're able to do what you feel God's calling you to do? That's why many of us don't do what God's called us to do. We get impatient, and we don't like to prepare. In fact, our culture, our American culture, praises youth. We lift up, you want to be young, you want to look young, this type of thing. And so, and even, and this goes even to our churches. Oh, you're a young person? Go off and do mission work. So we send you to the field to give a couple years and then come back and settle down and live your life. I'm not against youth doing mission work, and that, that can be a great place of preparation. But listen to me on this. Your years from 15 or 18 or whatever till you're 30 or whatever, and again, this can vary with people, but that should be where you are growing in character and developing and preparing to serve God in the long haul, and God will use those times in your life to prepare you, but don't skip the preparation. And Moses, at this age, whatever he, he was here, he's not ready to do what God has called him to do. He knew it. He knew the cause. Seems like it, but he's not ready. And so when he finds out this, these Hebrews, like when he goes to settle their fight, and he's like, well, are you going to do to us what you did to the other guys? You're going to kill them? He's like, oh, I'm in trouble. Then he finds out Pharaoh knew he killed one of those people, and Pharaoh's out for him. He runs, and he spends 40 years in the desert. You know what that was? Wasted years. No. That was prep time. God is big into prep time. That's preparation. I'm confident Moses, who went out and settled a fight and killed one guy and you know, you know, was doing this type of thing, I'm confident he wasn't even close to the meekest man on earth at that time. You have him out following sheep around the desert for 40 years. God does some work in his heart. Now God's ready to use him. And so after these years, God calls him, and God, and God is so creative. If you ever think that when you say yes to God, you're going to have to give up your life and it's going to be bad, it's completely the opposite. God is so creative in how he communicates, what he calls you to do. Following God is the best thing that you could ever do. You're not going to miss out on a thing. God wants to get his attention. He lights up a bush. And that's creative. You know, God spoke to him in an audible voice later on. Why didn't you right away? Moses, Moses. Yes? No. Let's light a fire. Okay? Wow. Moses gets his attention, and God talks to him then. And, and, and again, just for sake of time, God says, okay, I want you to go back, and you're to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses begins to make excuses. Okay? I think he gives like four different excuses as, 
Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not good with words. You know, I'm slow of tongue. He, uh, let's just look at these. His first one, he says, Who am I? Verse 11. Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Now, let's just write down our uh, first point here in this session. Thinking of you. Number one, God's plan for you is personal. God's plan for you is personal. I don't see how it could be any other way if God has created me and I am unique. I don't think God just said, I'm going to create somebody, just go for it, live your life, you know, have fun down there. No, he creates us for his glory. God's plan for you is personal. And when Moses asked this question, I think it's a question that many of us have asked when we feel like we're called to a difficult task. Who am I? You know what God's answer was? Well, Moses, by, by blood, you're a Hebrew. So I'm just calling you to save your own people. But you've been raised as an Egyptian. You can go back in there. You know the culture. You know the people. You can do this. But not only that, is you're a Midian. Like you've been living out here for 40 years. You understand the desert. You're going to spend some time out here. Moses, you are the man for the job. You can do it. That's not what he said. Don't write this down. Just look at this and let this soak in because I'm confident that the same message, the same answer God gives to Moses is what he tells you and I when we say, who am I? When I say, who am I? Who's my attention on? Where's my focus? It's on me. God didn't even answer the question. He says this, certainly I will be with you. Isn't that amazing? So go ahead and write that down now. Certainly, I will be with you. That'd be a good part to underline in your Bible. Verse 12, certainly, I will be with you. Excuse me, God, I ask, who am I? Why are you asking me to do this? I don't think I, who, who am I? That's really irrelevant. Certainly, I will be with you. If you feel a call, a burden for something, and you're like, well, God, who am I? And you can think you're humble in saying that, oh, who am I? You know, I can't do it. And, you know, no, you're focused on yourself. And I believe God's answer to you is, certainly I will be with you. What more do we need? If what is keeping you from taking that true step of faith and saying, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do, it's because, well, what if I can't do it? God's with you. Hey, when God's with you, it's going to be okay. The story of Joseph, and I mentioned him earlier, every time there was a bad time in his history and life, it always says this, but God was with him. And God was. It may not have seemed like it. Preparation is hard times. But God was with him. And Joseph needed to go through each one of these steps to where God could bring him to a place where he could use him. Certainly, I will be with you. When you are asking God, who am I? Or you ask your pastor or your parents or somebody else who's asking you to do something. Who am I? That's the wrong question. Is God with me? And if God's calling you to do something, certainly he will be with you. That was his response to Moses. Now here's why I'm convinced that God's plan for you is a personal plan. Moses' first objection was, well, who am I? And then he has another objection, and he's like, well, uh, when they say, who sent me, who, whose name, who do I say sent me? Okay, you say, I am that I am. You can't say God was or God will be. He's the I am. He was, he is, he will be, the I am. Then he says, well, they're not going to believe me. And God's like, well, Moses, you are right. They won't believe me. I never thought of that. Why do we think God doesn't know things? Like how often do we tell God, you know, God, your idea is good, but it's not going to work. Yeah, they'll believe you. He gives, he gives him some signs. And then he says this, well, I'm slow of speech. You know, my tongue doesn't work good. Uh, after the fourth excuse, if I'd have been God, I'd have said, okay, Moses, fine. Run after these sheep the rest of your life out in the desert. I'll find somebody else. God didn't do that. And I, you could debate this theology like could have god said okay i'll just use somebody else maybe but he didn't 
He got angry. He said, now go, and Moses, or, and your brother Aaron will help you. He'll be your mouth, so he'll deal with your slow tongue. He can help you. Go now. God didn't say, okay, I'll get somebody else. Because it was Moses who was created for this job. Am I not right? Could have God used somebody else? Well, he probably could have, but he didn't. God's plan is personal. God had this in mind when Moses' mother put Moses in the, in the basket. God's hand was on him. You're no different than Moses. God's hand's on you. And he has plans for you. They're personal. They're personal. Let's look at the second thing. The second thing that we get, I get from this is God's plan for you involves the present. And that's where the submission and the faithfulness comes in. God's plan for you involves the present. A young man was talking to one time. He said, he's going to Bible school. I said, oh, yeah, that's good. You know, why are you going to Bible school? I'm just trying to feel him out a little bit. Oh, uh, you know, I'm going hoping to find God's will for my life. Hmm. I don't know if they have a class on that or like, you know what I've found? That most times when we try to find God's will for our life, we spend our life trying to find God's will. Let me say that again. When we try to find God's will for our life, we spend our life trying to find God's will. That's not how God works. His plan involves the present. God shows us one step at a time. Write that down. God shows us one step at a time. This is what you're to do right now. This is what you're to do right now. You take this next step, one step at a time. Not, not the whole picture. I'm not sure of anywhere, any story in history that I could give you where God told them, here's your complete plan, one step at a time. Why does God do this? I think we would wrestle with putting ourselves into where he has us now. Let me, let me just quickly again give you my testimony. I, I told you I went to Minnesota, and I, t- I told you my wrestling of Minnesota to Grenada. The prep time that God has in your life, he won't waste any time, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, I grew up in a small Christian school. My family did some singing, and uh, I joined a group after my older sister got married, and, and we couldn't sing together as much as a family. I sang with uh, some other, another group in our area. We, on Saturday nights, we go to local prison and sing there and, and, and did some programs and this kind of thing. And I love to sing and, and play guitar. And so my dream was that after I graduated from school, went to SMBI for a couple terms, then I'm going to join Gospel Echoes and travel and, and, and sing and play guitar in prisons. And uh, I was excited about this, a good vision, okay? Um, God closed the door to that. I actually had put in an application. Uh, I was accepted. But God opened the door for me to move to Minnesota to teach school. The peace of God keeps us and guides us, and that's our last point, so we'll get to that. I went to Minnesota and taught school for eight years. I had no idea that me teaching school in Minnesota was preparing me to be a missionary pastor. But it very much prepared me. I didn't know that at the time. Or I, it would have been, I would have had difficulty thinking, oh, I'm going to end up going to Grenada. So, you know, I have two more years left and I'm out. No, no, it wouldn't work. God shows us one step at a time. You with me? And when it was right, God moved in our hearts, called us to Grenada. Now we went to Grenada. And if when we were in Grenada, if we'd been, you know what? It's just four years here. Then you're going to Thailand. I'd be like, okay, we're starting to think about Thailand. No, that would have been distractive. We can't handle knowing everything at the time. God tells us a step at a time. So we're in Grenada and we put our hearts into it. And when it was the right time, God calls us to go to Thailand. And he calls us in the right time so we can finish well and then we have time to prepare to go. And then we go to Thailand. He didn't say it's 11 years there. We didn't know that. We're just there until he tells us differently. And I can honestly say this. We did not wrestle while we're in Grenada or while we're in Thailand with these terms and when do we decide? Because the way we got there was by saying, God, yes, Lord. 
And the same call that puts you where you're at now needs to move you on. So God called us to Grenada. Once he wants us somewhere else, he'll tell us. He's a good communicator, and he did. And we went to Thailand. We're here, God, until he tells us somewhere else. One of my boys came to me one time and said, Dad, how long will we have to stay in Thailand? He struggled with being in Thailand. And your heart goes out to a child that's struggling with being where you're at. He said, son, we won't stay any longer than God wants us. But we're not going to go back because it's hard. That son today is grateful for those years in Thailand. And he knows that's where God had us. And we're in Pennsylvania now. Why are we in Pennsylvania? God called us here. How long are we in Pennsylvania? I don't know. I don't know what the next step is. So what do I do? Submitted and faithful. We make God's will out to be way too difficult. He's a good communicator. And it involves the present. It's not a life calling, okay? When we follow God's plans, let's write this down. You're not going to waste any time in your life. He doesn't waste time. And as I look at what God has me doing now in the full-time ministry in the States, that was my time in Thailand was preparing me for this. And I couldn't take anything that I've done now or, and pull out part of my past. It was all preparation. Yet God can use preparation as ministry time also. God's plan for you involves the present. Number three. Number three, God's plan for you requires a prior commitment. God's plan for you requires a prior commitment. That's a true step of faith. And again, I think the only exception to this is the current story I'm telling you. is Moses. Because it seems like he's fighting against God and he's wrestling with it and he knew what God was calling him to do. But I'm confident, I'm confident in this, that the number one reason we wrestle with hearing God in regards to answering, God, do you want me to do this or not? I'm confident the number one reason is lack of submission. And our job is to say, yes, I'll do it, God. Yes. Now, what I preached all day yesterday and all day so far today is still the same thing, submission. So how do we know? How do we know when this is what God wants us to do? And here's what it is. Number four. God's plan for you is confirmed by his peace. It says, and the peace of God, which passeth understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. I don't want you to raise your hand on this today. But I ask you this. How many of you are in the peace of God right now? In your heart, you have a peace that where you're living, uh, the job you're doing or the ministry that you're involved in, whatever it is, you have peace that you are where God wants you to be. If that's where you are, then really it's simple. Stay in that peace. And when an opportunity comes, say, yes, Lord, if you want me to do it, I'll go. And go ahead. Pray about it. Talk to your authorities about it. Fill out an application. And if you bump up against that peace, okay, then I guess not. And if the peace of God moves you, the peace of God, which path is understanding, will keep your hearts and minds. There have been some things that, wow, that seems like a great opportunity. And as I begin to look in, it's like, you know, that the peace just isn't there. If you know what the peace of God is, that's how he confirms it. And the peace of God, which path understanding, and he, this is key for us, keeps your hearts and your mind. That's where we do all our worrying. What if I choose to go to Grenada and that's not where God called me? Oh, no. Guess what? Don't make that decision. Tell God, God, if you want me to Grenada, I'll go. And if God wants you there, we've agreed he's a good communicator. He knows how to tell us. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And the peace of God which passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Another place the scripture says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You know what the word rule means here? It means umpire. So if we're playing a game of softball and you have an ump, and it's good to have an ump because 
you know, one, the team that's batting, you're safe every time, right? And the team that's in the field, they're out every time. Well, not quite, but if it's a close play uh, and you're playing in the field, you, you want to call them out, right? So you're playing this game of softball and you, the runner, comes home and it's a close play at the plate. And maybe you slide into home because you know the ball's coming in there and you do want to get a tag. So you slide under the glove and you touch the base and you know you're safe. But just as you touch the base, the catcher tags you with his glove and the ball's in the glove. And he knows you're out. What's everybody do at that time? They wait for the umpire to give the single. And it doesn't matter what the runner thinks. It doesn't matter what the catcher thinks. It doesn't matter what the stand thinks. It matters what the ump says. If he says out, you're out. If he says safe, you're safe. The peace of God is to be your ump. As you pray about going to the mission field, about taking this job, about joining this ministry, about offering to teach, whatever it may be, whatever this, the opportunities are, in, are that you're facing, let the peace of God be your ump. And I'm confident that when we are submitted, where we're saying, God, I'll do it if you want me to. And if not, I'll, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. If that's your heart posture, you're going to hear from God. God's a good communicator. And if if you are faithfully serving God and you're not hearing from him for the next thing, don't just say, okay, I'm just going to go try something. Like you can explore opportunities, but you're going to stay in that peace. Stay in the peace of God. And when God wants you to be doing something different, he's going to tell you. And he is so creative. He can light a fire in a bush. He can use whatever. He may use somebody coming up to you and say, you know what? Have you considered doing this? Hmm, God, is that of you? And you don't have to sweat figuring these things out. You just say, yes, Lord. God's plan for you. God's plan for you is this. It's personal, involves the present, requires a prior commitment, confirmed by his peace. I hope, I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. Don't try to find God's will for your life. Be faithful today where you're at. God is a lot like GPS. Uh, the first day I came, I used my GPS. The second day I came, I used GPS. The third day I came, I didn't need GPS. I knew how to go, and I got here, no problem. GPS is amazing in that it can take me from anywhere I am. And when you make a wrong turn, it's amazing how patient GPS are. They don't yell at you and like, I told you, turn around. No, it just says, you know, make a right-hand turn and then another right-hand turn. And then, you know, it, the GPS can take me from anywhere to where I need to go. Today, I needed to make a stop on the way here to someplace I've never been before. So I put that address into my GPS and it took me there. When I was ready to leave that place, I wasn't sure how to get here from there. So guess what I did? I just put this same address in my GPS and it took me from a different location to the same destination. You are not too far out of God's hand that he can't take you from where you are now to what he created for you. You have not messed up so bad that God can't speak to you now and take you where he wants you to be. You may not be in the peace of God today. You may have said no to God and you know that right now you're not in his peace and you're not doing what he had asked you to do and you know it. Guess what? You can surrender now and God can take you right now to where he wants you. He's a good father. He's got personal plans. He looks on you with jealousy. This is just good stuff for us. I see no other response to this message than just to be encouraged unless of or belonging to the Lord doesn't describe us. Then we're going to wrestle. But as a Christian, my life isn't my own. And I'm so glad that God, who knows the end from the beginning, when I say, yes, Lord, he's going to take me in a way that I would have never dreamed in my wildest dreams what my life would look like as I, when I was a young man. 
But when I look back now, I'm like, wow, God, it, you've been way too good to me. Like, I've got, I've got to serve you in different places. I've got, I've got so many different friends from so many different cultures. God has blessed me in so many ways. And if I would have tried to figure my life out myself, I would have, I would have never done, been able to do it. That's God. That's the God for each one of us. Let's pray. Father, come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, please, please, I pray that you would speak truth into our hearts about who you are. about your plans for us, about your ability to communicate. And Father, the questions that are still in our hearts and minds, you speak to them. Father, I believe that I'm speaking to young people that want to serve you. And I pray that if they have not already done this, they would say, yes, Lord. I'll do what you want, where you want it. And in the meantime, I'll be faithful right where I'm at. I pray that we all would be submitted and faithful for your glory. We'd get in your peace and we'd stay in your peace. And as your peace moves us to to another field or to continue in, in deeper work where we're at, whatever it may be, pray that we would stay in your peace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.